So to prepare for your discussion assignment, you wanting to read Painting in Flanders, which is 19.3. And one reason is simply that, as they say here, the Flemish painters were among the best. And to this day, we feel that way about this period. Their painting was amazing. And the strength of their painting is tied to the strength of their economy. So the authors write a strong economy based on the textile industry and international trade provided stability and money for a rapid Flemish flowering in the arts. So once again, we have a prosperous merchant class supporting art that serves their needs and values, just as we learned about with Siena and Florence in the 14th century. So they talk about these middle class institutions. Remember, it's not just individuals, it's also institutions, civic groups, town councils, wealthy merchants, important patrons, and they are exerting their power, just as we saw in Siena and Florence, to run their cities as mostly self-governing, even though they are, in theory, part of the landed nobility. I do want to say a few words about guilds. As the textbook authors state, guilds oversaw nearly every aspect of their members' lives, and high-ranking guild members served on town councils and helped run city governments. So guilds are the professional associations of skilled tradespeople, such as wool merchants, weavers, goldsmiths, and painters. Painters actually belonged to the pharmacy guild since they were chemists in their studios. In other words, guild identity was based on the materials you knew how to work. And guilds were in charge of granting professional licenses, certifying that you knew how to work your materials. If someone commissioned you and spent money at your workshop, they would get good quality work. So they were also in charge of establishing standards for training. A 15th century painter would typically begin as an apprentice in a master's workshop at approximately age eight or nine, gradually working up from just sweeping the studio floor to learning how to make drawings and eventually helping to make major commissions. And to graduate and receive your license and set up your own workshop, you would have to paint a presentation piece which was called a masterpiece. That's the origin of our term. It began with actually a professional licensing step. And so the textbook authors say even experienced artists who moved from one city to another usually had to work as assistants in a local workshop until they met the requirements for guild membership because a guild was local to a city and they controlled who gets to have a workshop. And if you haven't gone through their steps, they're going to essentially make you go through a licensing step again in their city. You can't take your guild licensing from Florence and bring it to Bruges or Ghent. So once you understand the guilds, you move forward and the textbook will focus on three major painters that you must know. The master of flame all here, and as you read this passage, Focus particularly on the questions of patronage, these merchant patrons who are, you see in the donor portrait. Also pay close attention to what you learn about common household objects serving as religious symbols. And of course, we're, we understand Jan van Eyck as the giant of this region and this period, especially the Ghent altarpiece which they go into in a little more, a few more points here. But moving ahead, Roger van der Weyden is really very close to Van Eyck's stature. Um, he's not as well known as they say, it, but I love this particular altarpiece that they have presented to you, his famous deposition. And one of the remarkable things about it is the way that it actually 
has a kind of playful idea that you're looking at a, a carved wooden altarpiece that would normally hold gold wooden figures, but now they have come to life in full color. So in other words, he's referencing an altarpiece like this one, which I showed to you, where the carved gilded figures in their intricate ornamental splendor would have been more expensive than painting. And here he's saying, well, look, painting can actually be just as amazing as sculpture. And this is a first sign of a kind of rivalry between painting and painters and sculptors sculptors between painting as a medium and sculpture as a medium that we will look at in more depth in Italy in the Italian Renaissance and also one of my favorite details here in the corners what looks like carved wooden decorative ornamentation actually is shaped like a bow and arrow because the patrons who have commissioned him to make this altarpiece belong to the Crossbow Makers Guild. So this is a, an example of a patronage, a collective patronage that is tied to the professional status of those who are excellent workers of materials, excellent tradespeople. 